Hey all, not Scott here. Your boy's back to tell you the rest of the Japan story, this time starting off where we left off in Nagia. Having done some prior research, I was a man on a mission to try out the local specialty Hitsumabushi at Bincho. Eating this was an experience and 38.50 yen. To introduce this dish, you eat this in four parts. Take one quarter and eat it as is, just as the universe intended. Second, take the other quarter and eat it with wasabi and spring onions. Eating it with those two dramatically changed the flavor profile, and I didn't even put a whole lot of wasabi. Lastly, it's where it gets really interesting, and that's when you pour tea broth on the third quarter to make unachazuke. Let me tell you that I really enjoyed this way of eating, as it provides a different texture to the meal. And for the last portion, eat it in whatever way you want, and I actually enjoyed eating it plain. Mainly because I like the powerful flavor of the eel and barbecue sauce, and the texture of the rice being drier as the unachazuke made me feel like I was eating porridge. That being said, it was a nice experience even as my heart goes out to my wallet. With nothing left for the night, I figured it was about time to hit up another arcade, trying out other games this time around like Wong Gone Midnight, Darts, and Solo Karaoke. I hate this so much. As I headed back to my hotel, I found myself at Yoshinoya for Gudon Round 2, and I'm happy to report that, uh, I don't know, I'm on Team Matsuya for this one. In other news, roller coasters. I love them, and Naga currently holds the title of having the longest roller coaster in the world. Figured that if I'm going to Japan, I might as well get my roller coaster credits too. Steel Dragon 2000 lived up to my expectations. With its huge 93.5 meter drop, max speed of 152.9 km per hour, and with multiple sustained airtime moments, this had to be the highlight of Nagashima. Another coaster I really liked was Hakugeya, a glass smooth hybrid ride by RMC, and I loved how the coaster seamlessly flowed into each of the elements. Overall a fun time, and I was able to speedrun all the coasters I wanted to ride in a little less than 4 hours. That being said, can we uh, make theme park speedrunning an actual thing? Nonetheless, it was back to the arcade, where I met up with the Nagoya Dance Rush players. <laughs> A hilarious bunch of people, and this guy? This guy is Riri, literally one of the best Dance Rush players in the world, and it was an honor to play with someone who inspired me to pick this game up. Closing out the Nagia arc, I did a few touristy things you could do in the city. Chief among them was Nagia Castle, complete with a kendo demonstration and a turret you can walk inside in. The gift shop was also pretty sick with these cool paper models. Then went out for Tonkatsu at the GR Tower next to Nagia Station, and it was an immediate S tier. Why? Let me explain. They presented the dang thing to me, and the first thing I noticed was that juicy section of fat stuck to the meat. It was at that moment I knew I made the right decision. First bite, and I was in love with that meat. It was so tender and fatty that I was caught by surprise, like every other food in Japan. Then you add it with a tonkatsu sauce, and frick yeah, it just... Ugh. Generally, I hesitate using tonkatsu sauce, as it can be a little too sour, but they got it right with this one, to the point that I couldn't imagine the two not being united together in delicious matrimony. The soup was also pretty good, it looked like miso if its parents died and became dark and brooding. That or it discovered Lincoln Park for the first time. Whatever its reasons, it packed a really nice depth of flavor, which to my surprise was because of the clams that's been stewed inside the soup. Best part? That it was 16.30 yen. At that kind of price point with that kind of flavor, you are definitely getting value for that if you're a US citizen. Rounded off the night with a spoopy visit to Atsuja Jingu in super cold weather, and not gonna lie, I kinda like the vibe of being relatively alone in a dark forest. Then the next morning came, snacking on some fresh metal pan and a weenie on the way out, stopping in Nara for one reason and one reason alone. Feeding the deer. <laughs> It was fun, and the deer were just so cute seeing them throughout the city, interacting with the humans. Visited the Todaiji temple nearby and got myself a Kuro Nikuman. There was amazing sweetness from the sauce, meat was great, and the burdock provided that satisfying crunch. Perfect for the cold weather I endured in Nara. A tier, I'd buy two and call it my lunch. Ending the short Nara arc here, I've come to Osaka and walked over to Shinsekai, which felt like I traveled back in time to 80s Japan. Izakayas on every street corner, people trying their luck at the shiteki stands, even fishing, which honestly kinda wanted to try. Ran into Akura, and the difference in quality was unbelievable. Tuna, shrimp, salmon, kalbi, all pretty good, and the fact that's less than a dollar per plate makes things really interesting. Thanks again, US to Japanese exchange rate. Also found this neat little retro arcade, which again kinda sells the whole e vibe of the place. Then I unexpectedly met the Osaka Dance Rush crew, going to Kappa Ramen to get some, well, ramen. Felt pretty special given that it was my first ramen in Japan and it did not disappoint. 
980 yen and the broth was nice and fatty, like you could see the fat in the broth. It was so rich and porky flavor. The noodles were thin and perfectly bouncy to my liking, and the chashu was superb, making the ramen even more satisfying. Bro, it was so heavy though that I couldn't eat it all sadly. Would definitely come back here again, especially when that ramen cost less than a thousand yen. For my first night in Osaka, I knew I was gonna have a great time, because the very next day I would be running around checking out what the city had to offer, like this cute anime girl at Namba Station. With Osaka Amazing Pass on hand, I really enjoyed the views from Umeda Sky, learning about its engineering and the lower floors were also rather interesting with the whole early Showa era facade. Osaka Castle was pretty neat too, seeing the real life history behind the castle I've invaded many a time during Shogun 2 campaigns, not to mention learning about the life of the Chad Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Checked out the Tsutenkaku Tower all the way back in Shinsekai for the Glico exhibit and Anya Doll and catchy anime songs that I don't want to be copyrighted for, before eating some omurais I can't feel and I legitimately have no complaints. The egg was nice and silky, not overcooked at all, melting nicely with the ketchup rice, especially when you get a piece of chicken in that bite for the contrast and texture. The demigloss sauce was a nice finish too, letting the savoriness be a perfect counterweight to the ketchup sweetness. I understand why this is considered comfort food as eating it just made me feel good inside. For 1050 yen? Aw oh yeah, this is amazing. Also, it's right inside Naba Station, making it a convenient choice when heading into Dotombori. Took a river cruise and had a hilarious tour guide who sprinkled in some Kansai dialect as I beheld the entertainment district being all lit up. Legit, I could spend days just exploring this one area of Osaka, getting swept up in the lively atmosphere, even spontaneously started a small food crawl at Pablo's with a nice and light 290 yen cheese tart. The structural integrity of the tart is superb, and the sour notes really do hit it for me. Got gyo's at Osaka Osho, 6 pieces for 300 yen, delicious and juicy in every bite, especially with that crisp bottom. Add some sauce on that and in the words of Guy Fieri, you're going to Flavortown. However, a trip to Osaka wouldn't be complete without takoyaki and snagged 6 balls for 580 yen. It was good simple takoyaki, not the most mind blowing per se, but the big octopus chunk was a pleasant surprise. But all the fun and games would end that night, as I was about to embark on a grand military operation. Conquering Universal Studios Japan I had this whole plan to wake up early, go on a weekday when the Japanese kids are back in school, and enjoy empty lines, a quick in and out adventure. Then, everything changed when the other Asians attacked. Despite that slight miscalculation, I got a quick credit on the flying dinosaur and entering into Nintendo World went off without a hitch. The theming of this place was out of this world. For such a small land in a corner of the park, I felt like I entered into another realm. It was fan service galore, and it just felt so alive with all the interactivity. Mario Kart the ride was pretty fun, and given that I'm single, I shaved a whole 20 minutes from a 90 minute wait, which is pretty good actually, and because capitalism, there was a gift shop full of Mario themed merch. Yeah, you're, you're not getting me today, Universal. Though, if you had Fire Emblem merch on the other hand, uh... Kenopio's Cafe. This thing was an 80 minute wait for what was solid amusement park food. But let's be real here, that's not exactly a high bar to clear. For 4,500 yen, I opted for the Mario burger, and the meat wasn't dry at all, with that burger sauce we all know and love. It was a good solid meal. The pizza soup, on the other hand, I'm not sure how to feel about it. It wasn't bad per se, but I didn't necessarily feel anything special about it, I'd rather just eat a pizza. Regardless, I demolished that thing because I didn't eat breakfast trying to beat out all the Chinese and Korean tourists. Leaving the restaurant, there was still one more ride to complete, and that was Yoshi's Adventure, getting a nice vantage point of the park even as Yoshi's giant head blocks like 50% of the front. On my way out, Yoshi Mango Lassi called my name, and it was so fire, tasted refreshing, and the drink had really nice sour notes from the yogurt, complementing the mango sweetness, which is amplified once the whipped cream and mango chunks get mixed into the drink, culminating into a creamy explosion of flavor. Of course, there was more of the park to explore, like the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, and considering how long the wait times were for the rides, I knew speedrunning the park was going to be impossible. With that in mind, I took my sweet time enjoying the rest of the park. The Spider-Man ride was pretty cool, and given how the 20-year contract Universal had with Marvel was about to expire, it was a joy getting to experience this piece of theme park history before it shuts down for good. I also got to experience full force just how big the minions are in Japan, and tried to take out a loan from the Bank of Evil sponsored by Japan. Japan Airlines, rounding off the evening with a ride on the Hollywood Dream, getting that last bit of airtime in before closing. Since it was only 7.30, it was back to Dotombori for Okonomiyaki and Yakisoba at Kredoru. 
The okonomiyaki was delicious as the sauce melted well with the sweetness of the mayo. The bacon made it more satisfying to eat as that porky flavor mixes in with the sauces and the batter. Cabbage added some layer to the pancake, creating a nice textural distinction with the crunch of the cabbage. It was so good, I legitimately wanted to cook this when I got back home. Yakisoba was also great, really appreciated the portion of meat and sauce. I'm the type to enjoy more saucy noodles, and this delivered. The savory yakisoba sauce has become an addiction, and eating it with all the toppings made the experience even better. Better. On to the last city, my first Japan trip had to have a stop in Kyoto. Fushimi Inari Shrine was beautiful with all these Tori gates as I hiked up Mount Inari in cold weather. Found some rather interesting sights on my way up the mountain, taking in the serenity of the place and getting rewarded with a view for my efforts. Making my way down, I might have accidentally ended up at a festival, getting some karage and menchi katsu for a snack, visiting Kyo Mizudera right after. So many shops selling traditional Japanese snacks and souvenirs lined the path towards the main area as I admired the architecture at the top of the hill. Having enough of old Japan for the day, it was back to the modernity of Kyoto, visiting the Nishikiyama shopping district with its airsoft shop, random shrine, and gacha machines. Don't you just love gambling for random stuff? Also ate some pancakes at Shiawase no Pancake. It's so fluffy, it literally melts in your mouth. The butter and caramel provided a nice sweet and salty contrast, then when you eat it with the cream, it just elevates it by giving that extra bit of sweetness. Akechi approves. After some wandering around, I finished off the night doing some last minute souvenir shopping at the Nintendo store and a curry at Koko Ichibanya. It was robust with a deep flavor from all the spices and adding it with cheese makes it better with the creaminess. The beef was perfectly cooked and tender, making it a really great component to this already amazing curry. For 960 yen, it was an overall great time, a golden standard, a high bar that all other curries should aspire to. Now my final day in Kyoto was a bit more low key, taking a stroll along the Arashiyama Ben Boo Force, munching on some warabi mochi before catching up with some homies at Kyoto Station. And I was rather surprised by just how big this station was. In there, we found an entire ramen street with one shop serving tori ramen. Frickin' bomb, the broth was full of that chicken flavor and was actually a bit thick, which wasn't a bad thing at all. Egg was perfect as always, noodles too, but the slight soy flavor of the chashu pork had to be my favorite part of the meal. Ending off with a matcha pop and a delicious honey Belgian waffle from Mannequin. Reaching the last stretch of my journey, it was time to come home, but not before Nagi around too. You see, my American friends were there for a dance rush tournament where people from pretty much all across Japan were in attendance. It was a wonderful experience, reuniting with my friends, meeting the Japanese community, finding that despite our differences in race, language, and culture, we can find a way to relate to each other through dance or whatever this is. <laughs> With my little side quest done, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my final meal, and I went out with a bang with another Nagia specialty, Mizokatsu. It's an S tier, because the miso sauce just added a whole nother layer of flavor on top of an already great katsu. If I had one word to describe my first real solo trip to Japan, it would be... Chaos. I was always caught by surprise with something unexpected happening, like taking the wrong train, finding out something was closed, or just simply not having enough time. Yet for all these mishaps, I can say that without a doubt, I have experienced moments that will be core memories, and I would not have it any other way. The sights I've seen, the culture I've experienced, and the people I've met, building knowledge and connections that I can rely on when I inevitably return. But as for now, all I can say is Japan, mata ne. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.